Welcome back to Collectability. Recently, I asked the question on Instagram, is what makes a vintage watch? Can a 20-year-old watch be considered vintage? People were very emotional with their answers, and I'd love to know what you think on YouTube, so please comment below on what you think a vintage watch actually is. What is the cutoff in your opinion? For many, the year 1989 represents the year that modern day Patek Philippe was born. That if something is before 1989, it's vintage. If it's after 1989, it's modern. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The answer to the question of why is in these 30 pages right here. This document that I recently found is called the 1989 Communications Program from Patek Philippe. This was meant to be an internal document shared with retailers and PR firms around the world of how Patek Philippe wanted to reposition and message themselves from 1989 moving on. During the year 1989, there was an all out program of information, events, new watches, auctions, and the list goes on to communicate their new strategy to the world. And that is what we're going to dig into. But first, let's go back to 1989 itself. What was, what was going on? It was the 150th anniversary of the brand. It was 150 years since Patek Philippe was born in 1839. Philippe Stern was the managing director and Henri Stern, his father, was the president. During the 1970s and 80s, no doubt Philippe Stern had a vision for what he wanted to do in 1989, together with his father. But Philippe Stern, in my opinion, as a historian, was the one that orchestrated and created the strategy from 1989 that I dare say has completely put them on track for the Patek Philippe that we know today. One of the first major projects that uh, Mr. Stern is credited with bringing to the world of Patek Philippe is the development of this watch the Calibre 89. In 1979, as this book very eloquently describes in great detail, in 1979, Max Studer, who is the technical director, he proposed an idea to make a watch even more complicated than the Henry Graves super complication. Now the Graves super complication was delivered originally in 1933 but Patek Philippe wanted to make something even more complicated. And one story of many very interesting stories shared in this book is at first they considered making a replica of the Henry Graves super complication, but that was quickly abandoned by Studer and uh, Mr. Stern in favor of making a watch that was even more complicated, an obvious grand gesture of celebration and they considered his suggestion to make this watch a uh, momentous occasion and for 10 years they threw everything they could into developing this extraordinary watch. But within this book from 1989, we see lots of interesting insight into the world of Patek Philippe and what they were trying to do. And there's one particular sentence I'd like to share with you from this book that really sets the messaging of what they were trying to do in 1989. The 150th anniversary of Patek Philippe in 1989 is the opportunity for the company to rejoice in its heritage, to win world acclaim with the completion of the Calibre 89, to reaffirm that its legitimacy lies in the pursuit of the best possible. And that loyalty to this principle will as it has done for one and a half centuries, bring its own commercial success. So at the end of the day, this was a commercial exercise, but it was an opportunity for Patek Philippe to tell its own story. And there was lots of competition in 1989, as there is today. And Patek Philippe uh, strategized in a way that was quite creative. And looking through the pages of this book, we could learn what they did first, very interesting, Philippe Stern outlines in the introduction of this commercial booklet what he describes as a legend becomes reality. And the term legend becomes very important to their, their marketing. He tells the history of uh, Patek and Philippe and then dovetails towards the conclusion 
uh, to the sale of the Caliber 89, the most complicated and valuable timepiece ever created, the exhibition of the private Patek Philippe collection at Geneva's Musée de Horlagerie, and to be among many international events in keeping with this reputation. This book outlines what they did that year, and uh, that is what I'm gonna outline with you right now. First, in 1982, uh, the famous Banbury and uh, Huber book was published. This was a way of Patek Philippe to look back at their tradition, to tell their stories, to look at the watches that they acquired for their private museum, which is essentially Mr. Cern's private collection, and to research and document and tell the stories of each individual timepiece. But in advance of the 1989 launch, they needed a book to tell the story of the wristwatches, because in 1982, it's just the pocket watches. In 1989, it was the story of wristwatches. Now, this particular copy is one of the, uh, the rare leather-bound copies of this book, originally published in 1988 and then distributed in 89. And for those of you who haven't seen one of these extraordinary examples, of the leather-bound, one of 300 copies, it's actually signed by Henri Stern, Philippe Stern, by uh, uh, Huber and Banbury, and, and my copy is labeled uh, numbered number 96. This book we all call the Bible of Patek Philippe, and it's uh, important for you to have a copy of Huber and Banbury or a later edition in your collection or in your library, because this is the book that everyone needs to read. In a world where everyone's looking online, I love books. You can still learn so much from books, and it's so much fun every time you open the pages of the Huber and Banbury books to learn more and to look at things differently than maybe the first time that you read, read the book. All right, another amazing primary source bit of material are the general catalogs, as they're called. These are the product catalogs that showed what was new, what was um, offered year by year. And in the 1989 catalog, we opened it up and we see a really interesting uh, introductory letter from no other than Henri Cern, the president of Patek Philippe. And in summary, he's writing, dear friends and customers, a fresh wind is blowing at Patek Philippe. You have in your hand one of the first concrete and practical manifestations of the fresh wind that we're blowing at Patek Philippe in the years to come. They knew exactly what they were doing in 1989. Our general catalog has undergone a metamorphosis. It now appears in the form of an extremely practical ring binder, which allows you to take or replace any pages that you need to, so it makes it easier for you to update to the latest collections. And this is a tradition that uh, continues within Patek Philippe today with their ring binders. But then he outlines a fresh wind to the collection, a fresh wind to advertising, a fresh wind to the corporate identity, a fresh wind to the training and motivation of sales personnel, and finally, a fresh wind in public relations. And that is key to the story and of what we see within the pages of this book with their public relations campaign. So they outlined that tradition was their future. And this is a very interesting seal that you'll see on everything associated with 1989, the 150th anniversary medallion, and it always says, tradition is our future they realized that they had to look to the past in order to succeed in the present and move forward in the future in a way that uh, was, was quite bold. So some new traditions began in 1989. First, we see the reemergence of coins, of commemorative coins. And I have one right here to show you because people forget about these coins. You see them um, occasionally late 19th century, Patek Philippe coins show up on the market but the ones from 1989 are absolutely beautiful. And uh, for any of the 1989 watches, it has one of these commemorative coins. And we've seen since 1989, every time there's an anniversary or any sort of commemoration, there is uh, an amazing um, commemorative coin that's offered. So here we have the piece that celebrates the 150th anniversary from 1839 to 1989. As part of their 1989 strategy, they wanted to celebrate the pieces from the past in order to propel the demand for the pieces of the future. Perhaps the most 
global and strong statement that Patek Philippe made was with the art of Patek Philippe cell, held in conjunction with Anticorum in 1989. It was a sale unlike anything the world has ever seen before. Yes, there are a couple of theme auctions, but nothing of the magnitude as the art of Patek Philippe. It was done in conjunction with Patek Philippe, in conjunction with their PR, and frankly, in conjunction with the Stearns directly. It was a sale that was unlike anything the world has ever seen before and frankly, has ever seen since. The watch that was the ultimate storyline at the end of the day was the Calibre 89 in yellow gold, which sold on April 9th, 1989 for $3.2 million. This was an extraordinary sum and the mass media picked it up and it was a frenzy. Everyone was talking about the Calibre 89. In fact, in New York, Dennis Miller during Weekend Update even talked about the sale of the Calibre 89 as an overpriced turnip and to this day, for those that watched Saturday Night Live back then, they remember seeing this watch. It was something that was in the public imagination and, and a watch that to this day everyone continues to talk about. What people often forget is during that same day on April 9th, 1989, it was not only the sale of the super complication, there were 300 other Patek Philippe watches sold in the Art of Patek Philippe sale, including uh, some pieces that make my heart skip to this day, like this Platinum 2499 fourth series, one of two known to exist. Or here we have an up-down indicator, uh, a bulletin astronomical watch made for no other than Henry Graves. You can see his coat of arms. But then you turn the page and what do you find? There's a second Platinum Observatory watch also made for Henry Graves Jr. I mean, just those three watches I, I just extraordinary to see. In addition, we have some other highlights, including these Cloisonne World Time 2523, and then we have a 605 Cloisonne. And here we have a reference 3449, one of three known of this uh, very famous perpetual calendar. Every page reveals a piece that's celebrated icons from the world of Patek Philippe. Here, a rectangular minute repeater uh, made for Brock in LA from 1927. Um, my point being is Patek Philippe cut no corners in working with Anticorum to create a blockbuster sale that we're still talking about to this day. It was bigger, more impressive, more exciting than any other watch auction that ever occurred before. And Anticorum worked very closely with Patek Philippe to work with the various distributors around the world to tour this collection. Here in the United States, Patek Philippe and Anticorum partnered with Tiffany to show the highlights of this collection, including the Calibre 89 in advance of the exhibition. So it was a global tour that had amazing market penetration. They got in front of retailers, they got in front of end consumers. And when the sale finally occurred, everybody was lining up to try to get into the room. And I encourage all of you to listen to the podcast I recently recorded with no other than Osvaldo Patrizzi, the founder of Anticorum, who shares some inside stories of that fateful day when he was the auctioneer and hammered down all of these pieces and not only established his place in history, but helped get the word out about Patek Philippe to a wider audience. For everyone who owns a Patek Philippe or understands the history of Patek Philippe or frankly has been part of the mania in recent years from the world of Patek Philippe, we could all go back to 1989 and see how Mr. Stern's DNA, his plan, the master plan that he put forth defined the last three and a half decades and frankly will continue on into the future. 1989 was the year that Patek Philippe published so many books, shared so much information, and they established themselves in the most dominating way as the finest watch brand in the world. As part of the 1989 celebrations, Patek Philippe released an amazing series of special pieces, including numerous limited editions. 
Here we have a 3974 uh, perpetual minute repeater, the 3979 minute repeater. We also have the jump hours, the celebrated 3979. We have these very beautiful pendant watches that uh, we sometimes come across, which were made for women to wear. We have the 3960 officer's watches. And uh, of course the officer watches, you opened up in the back and it says in commemoration of the 1989, 150th anniversary. If you want to learn more about these important anniversary pieces, please read my colleague Tanya Edwards' article on collectability and you'll be able to get in great detail on each of these pieces. But before we wrap this video, I have a special surprise for you. Within this box, I have some important pieces, literally some time capsules from 1989. Here we have on the left, a reference 3979. This is the minute repeater. It recently came back from Patek Philippe service, so I'm, I'm not gonna open the bag. But uh, this little repeater with an enamel dial has one of the loudest, clearest, it's an angelic tone to the minute repeater. And the 3979 is a personal favorite of mine. See here, closest to me, I have a reference 844 minute repeating perpetual calendar. This particular pocket watch makes my heart skip. The condition is perfection. Absolutely stunningly sharp edges, last serviced by Patek Philippe, and unbelievably preserved. And before we end this video today, I'd like to take a moment for us to listen together to this minute repeater from 1989. Now that's a message from 1989 that will always ring true. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to Collectability on YouTube and Instagram. And remember, enjoy the hunt.